So this is the Mamiya RB67. RB stands for rotating back. So you can actually take a portrait of somebody and then you can turn the back and take a landscape. Now the 67 and RB67 stands for six by seven format or six by seven centimeters. This camera was invented in 1970. It has a sleek design similar in appearance to a Hasselblad. Unlike the Hasselblad, which is a 6x6, the RB67 is a 6x7, hence the name. This camera cut its teeth in the studio at portrait photographers and was preferred by many of them for years. They came in three different models, the Pro, the Pro S, and the Pro SD, all with slight upgrades along the way. At the end of the day, they're all variations of the same camera. It eventually was replaced by the RZ67, which is a slightly lighter and more advanced version of this camera. The RB67 from Mamiya is a single lens reflex camera. It deploys a modular system which consists of four main parts. You have your body, which is a box that attaches all your other parts. You have your film back, you have your lens, and you have your viewfinder. As I mentioned, this has been used in countless sessions in the studio, but there are some crazy photographers out there who actually use it out in the field without the assistance of a tripod. And that's also probably why I have tennis elbow. This thing is incredibly heavy. It's not practical for location shoots, but I love the results it gives me. So I am just crazy and I use it anyway. I think it looks amazing for editorial shoots. It's beautiful for portraits. Uh, it's a medium format film camera. And while the name suggests it is a six by seven, you can also buy film backs uh, that come in different formats. So even though standard, it comes in a six by seven, you can actually purchase film backs for it, uh, which come in six by 4.5, which come in six by six, six by seven, which is what this is. And then I believe they also have six by eight and six by nine. You can also get Polaroid backs for it if you wanna test shots before you waste your incredibly expensive film. It's a 120 format camera, but you can also get 220 backs for it even though 220 film is pretty much impossible to find nowadays. One of the cool things about the removable back on it is you can be in the middle of a session, you could use different film stocks. For instance, let's say I'm shooting black and white on this film back and I decide I wanna do a shot in color. I simply grab a different film back that has color film loaded on it, I load it up, and then I'm ready to go. Another cool feature is you can just rip the end of your film box off and you can put it on the back of the film back so you can identify what kind of film you have in the film back. Now, as you'll notice, you'll see this little plate on here. That's actually called a dark slide and that's what protects the film when you take the film back off. On the version that I have, you can't actually take the film back off unless you have the dark slide in. It protects you from yourself. Uh, you also can't take a picture unless you take the dark slide out. It's kind of like a safety on a gun. My Pro S model has a cool feature where you can actually take the dark slide and store it on the side of the camera, which is good because you don't want to lose it. Okay, so here's the process of removing the film back. First of all, make sure your dark slide is in. Now, remove each of these locks on both sides of the film back. Once you've removed the locks, detach your film back. Now, to replace the film back, you see those two pins on each side? Line them up with the film back. Now, Slide your locks back into place, that's it. So this camera uses what's called a leaf shutter. So most of you out there who are used to using SLRs and mirrorless cameras, when you take a picture, there's a shutter inside the camera's body, but with a leaf shutter, the shutter's actually inside the lens. So that's really important to understand if you switch over to this format. The way you take a shot on this is there's a little button right here. And when you're ready, you just push the button and you take a shot. Now, you also have to wind the film, which is right here. You'll just take this and pull it forward and it'll, it'll go to the next frame. Then when you're ready to go, you cock it again, take the shot again. Now, I don't have any film in here, so the way you can actually like practice it is you gotta hit this switch right here, which is a really important switch because what this switch does is it allows you to take multiple exposures on the same frame. That sounds pretty cool, except it's also very easy to bump on this model. I also wanna give you a friendly reminder that if you're gonna switch the single and multiple exposure switch, which black is single, red is multiple, 
Don't forget to switch it back or you're going to take a bunch of exposures on the same frame. If you're coming over from mirrorless or SLRs, you can rejoice in the fact that the RB67 also uses detachable lenses. To attach the lenses, cock the lever, align the red dots, and turn the ring clockwise. So this is the mirror up release socket. I never use it. I'm a portrait photographer who hand holds his camera. If you wanna take pictures on a tripod with a cable release, you can plug it into this socket and it'll allow you to do that. I'm not gonna do a tutorial on that because I don't own a cable release. I don't use a cable release and there's probably better videos out on YouTube that show you how to use it anyway. So when you flip the lens over, you see the slider right here? This is the focal distance calculator. I'm not gonna go into details on how to use one of these. You're on YouTube. Go look up how to use one of these. All right, so to focus the camera, just turn this knob on the side. Notice that it uses a bellows system. If you wanna lock the focus, move this lever forward, and then to unlock it, move it backward. If you look at the bottom of the lens, there is this slider right here. This slider is an exposure simulator. I don't find it to be useful at all, but if you think it's useful, tell me in the comments below. Let's talk exposure. To change the exposure, take this aperture ring and turn it. As you turn the ring to the right, the numbers get lower, it lets in more light. You turn the ring the other way, the numbers get higher and it lets in less light. The ring above it is your shutter speed. You use the red dot in between the two to align your shutter speed to your aperture. Now you see this X right here? You pretty much leave it there if you're gonna use modern flash. Nobody uses those old flash bulbs that you used to see the press use, but if you were to flip that switch, it would go from X to M. You don't want it on M, always leave it on X. In order to remove a lens, you do have to first cock the shutter. So go ahead and cock it. Then locate the ring right there, twist it to the right, then simply detach the lens. All right, so one final word on lenses. If you're coming over from DSLR or mirrorless, you usually just take the back cap and attach it to the lens. But in this case, you just seat the back cap and then twist the ring and then it locks. So it's just a little different. I wanna make sure you keep that in mind. All right, to attach your viewfinder, you see these two notches right here? You're gonna attach them to the two pegs that you see right there. You push this button under the logo and then slide it in. That's it. Now, to open the waist level finder, you just pull this part up right here and the magnifying glass pops up. Sometimes it won't be up. To pop it up, all you gotta do is grab this little gray button right here and push it in. That's it. All right, so let's have a little tutorial about how to change the film on the RB67. When you're done with the roll of film, the spool ends up here. You need to take it off and put it over here. You also wanna make sure that your film back is reset, which is important. You want the number counter to be on S, not on 10 or any other number. The next step is you need to take your film in such a way to where the black part is wrapping around this side of the cassette facing forward. To accomplish that, you see this tiny little button right here? I need to push that button in order to load my spool. When you push that button, you take the bottom part of your spool, you see where that hole is, and then you go ahead and place it into the cassette. You should listen for a snap. Sometimes it doesn't snap, but usually it snaps and fastens into place. Now you just wrap it around, make sure that black part is facing out, turn it around, and then you look for a catch that you'll feed the film into and then grip it with your two fingers like that. While I hold the reel with my right hand, I then do a long pull of the film advance with my other hand. I just do it in one motion. When I complete this, the arrows end up falling just a little bit short of each other. To align the arrows, do a very slow turn of the film advance until the arrows align. Once you've completed your alignment, take the cassette, put it on the film back, close the door, and then snap that silver lock where you see my index finger. Now advance the film to the first frame using the film advance. I definitely don't like the process of using flash with the RB67. Because of PC cables that you plug in, by the way, right here, this little spot right here is where you plug in a PC cable and then you have to get an adapter and put it right here, a cold shoe, hot shoe adapter. And then you can use your trigger with your lights, your studio strobes and all that. I've noticed that it's very finicky. So a lot of times what I have to do to get around this 
happens is I actually take the film back off when I have film in here and I take practice shots. I just make sure that the actual flash is triggering and then when I see that I've triggered the flash a couple times, I'll then put the film back on and I'll get it ready to go and I'll take some pictures. Uh, that has cut down on my failure rate quite a bit. Another con of the camera is that if you've never used a medium format like this, if you use the waist level finder, now you see here I've got a prism finder and I'll explain why I have a prism finder. When you use a waist level finder and you look through, everything is backwards. So when you go right, you're actually going left and you go left, you're actually going right. That will really screw you up if you're trying to take pictures. Now, is it something that you can get used to as you use the camera? Of course it is. However, if you just buy this prism finder, it makes life a lot easier. However, already remarked that this camera weighs a ton and when you put the prism finder on it weighs even more this is the lightest prism finder i could find them i think it's called the mark ii or the version 2 prism finder and uh it's the lightest of the prism finders uh that they make from what i saw so that's something to keep in mind it adds even more weight now there's more cons so you really got to be into this one final word on the viewfinders no matter which one you get, they're pretty dim. In the studio, you're gonna need a really bright modeling lamp or you're gonna need to spend some money on a digital back, which is not cheap. If you're not willing to do either of those, you probably just need to use this camera outdoors. Another con that you might not be thinking of is if you come from the world of mirrorless and autofocus and all that fun stuff, well, there is no autofocus on this camera. It's all manual focus. It's quite easy to miss focus when you're shooting at a shallow depth of field because medium format has a more shallow depth of field already. So like if you're shooting at F 4.5, you're actually like more shooting closer to like F, I don't know, 2.8 or something like that. You're, it's a much more shallow depth of field. Your margin for error is smaller and when you're manually focusing, it's actually quite easy to miss the targets. So that's something that you have to get used to. Film for medium format is not cheap. That's not necessarily just a con of the RB67, that's a con of medium format film in general. It's something that is an investment, you really need to be into it, you can't really dip your toe in it, you pretty much gotta go all in. Now that I've gotten the cons out of the way, let's talk about the pros. So even though film cameras are increasing in price day by day, you can still buy the bodies for the RB67s between a couple hundred to five hundred dollars, depending on the model and condition that you get. That's pretty cheap for a camera body that produces super high resolution negatives. You can also get them bundled with a lens, bundled with a couple different types of film backs for five, six hundred dollars. You can even buy full kits that come with several lenses and several film backs for less than a grand. That's pretty cheap considering how much premium camera bodies in the digital world and premium lenses in the digital world cost. Now, personally, I shop on eBay. I usually use a lot of the shops out of Japan. I had great luck and experiences with the shops in Japan. The description is usually accurate. They'll take care of me if I encounter a problem. And because of that, I'm okay paying the extra shipping. The lenses can still be bought for pretty cheap. Like you can get a 180 millimeter, which in the full frame world is about a 90 uh, F 4.5 for less than $100 on eBay. Now, if you think about what an 85 millimeter costs in the mirrorless world or even the full frame world for shallow depth of field, you know, you're talking 1000 2000 sometimes even $3,000 for a nice portrait lens. The really cool thing about the lenses for the RB system, if you get the Secor C lenses, they can actually be bought for relatively cheap. And they make a more modern KM version of these lenses, which from what I've seen is a little bit better. But you know, now you're talking maybe $500 for a lens, which still $500 for a premium lens is actually a pretty good deal. Whereas when you try to get a premium portrait lens, in the uh, full frame or the mirrorless world, as I mentioned, you're gonna spend thousands of dollars. As I mentioned, the RB67 system has three different levels of lenses. You do need to go online and look for a compatibility chart for some of the newer ones and the older ones. I settled on the Secor C lenses because they were the best value. They have great optical quality. They're not expensive. They didn't require adapters for my RB67 Pro S. I also own the 50 millimeter model, which translates to 25 millimeter in full frame. It's perfect for landscape photography. I use it for environmental portraits when I really want to show off the environment. You can get that one for less than $300, oftentimes $250 for the set course C version. 
I also own the 90 millimeter, which translates to 45 millimeter in full frame. It's just tight enough to get the subject, but also wide enough to get the environment. You can get the 90 millimeter oftentimes for two to three hundred dollars for the Secor C version. Then there's the often overlooked 127 millimeter, which oftentimes is actually just thrown in with bodies on eBay. You can get this lens between $100 and $150. The key takeaway for me from looking at all of these images is that even though these lenses are 50 years old, they don't cost that much, and they take fantastic photos, as long as the manual focus doesn't bother you. Despite all the cons of this camera, at the end of the day, it comes down to quality. I think it's what attracts a lot of people to medium format in the first place. The pictures that this camera takes are absolutely spectacular. And while it's not a good solution for everyone, I find that it's a great solution for me. Medium format film, when you scan it at very high resolutions, actually has better quality than a lot of high megapixel camera sensors that you see today. Also, I prefer the look of film, and there's just something special about medium format. Despite all the cons at the end of the day, when you nail it, it's absolutely worth it. I thank you all for checking out the video today. I probably scared a lot of you off from buying medium format and film, and that's okay, because I want to keep those prices low. However, some of you might have seen this video and been like, ooh, sweet. And for those of you, hopefully I reached you, hopefully I educated you. Um, if you like what you saw today, please click the like and subscribe buttons below. I'd love to hear your comments. I'm really wanting to take this channel in a user-driven direction. So if there's something that you want me to review, a technique you want me to go over, just leave it in the comments below and I'll put it in my list of things to get around to. I really do appreciate the support. I thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.